I love the lyric of that bridge, you keep on getting better. And this is one of those things that could go without saying. But often when we use the phrase, it goes without saying, we skip saying something that really should be said. He is worthy for us to just say this out loud. He's so good, he actually doesn't get any better than he is. We just grow in the brokenness of life to understand a little bit more tomorrow how good he is than we understood today, right? And I'm saying, man, where, where's the people of God who've been following Jesus long enough to say, the more I follow him, the better I understand him to be. Man, he's good. And here's good news for you today. You might feel like, but he's so much better than he used to be. Surely I have finally figured it out. <laughs> and I just want to tell you that lyric is going to be true until the day you see him face to face. And then your mind is going to straight up be blown at how good he is. And I just think that deserves to be said this morning. Last week, we started off this part of the service um, with, with kind of a, a sad goodbye um, and it's interesting when you do life together with family, the, the deal with family is there's hellos and there's goodbyes. That's just reality, right? We, we don't want to be this plastic family that only talks about uh, the, the warm, fuzzy thing. We want to be real with each other. And so uh, last week we said goodbye to a family that maybe you don't personally know well, but the Red Cliffs have been at this church for decades and moving out to Wichita Falls to take care of their aging parents and and. and and it's interesting as, as they're, uh, we're kind of saying goodbye to them because of their aging parents. Um, here's the amazing thing about being part of family. This morning, we get to say a hello. Um, in the room this morning is seven-day-old Silas McGowan. Is that amazing? Like seven days old? So goodbyes and hellos, right? Um, we just keep having babies around here, man. It's like, this is cool. This, we love hellos, right? Now, I have to say this specifically about Silas being born. Um, in about two weeks, we're going to meet Silas in Acts chapter 15. And I told Libby, if you weren't so selfish, you just waited two weeks because that would have made for a great introduction to the sermon. I just cannot believe that you were that selfish. Um, would only be said by a man who's clearly never given birth, right? <laughs> Every woman in the room was like, and are you done? Let's go. <laughs> please grab your Bibles, if you would, please, this morning. If you don't have one, there's one underneath the seat in front of you. And that's our gift to you today if you don't own a Bible, because we think pretty highly about this book. And so, matter of fact, we're going to say a creed together about what we believe before we jump in. So hold up your Bibles, and let's declare this with some conviction and passion this morning. The Bible is the word of God. The truth of the Bible will change my life. Lord, open my heart and awaken my mind and give me grace to respond. Change me for your glory and my joy. Amen. Thank you so much. Please turn back to Acts chapter number 13 again. Acts chapter 13. It's page 867 if you're using one of those Bibles from the seat in front of you. Uh, page 867. Acts chapter 13, last week was kind of a historic week. We, I feel like we're saying that every week here in the study of Acts because it actually is true. <laughs> Literally every page is historic. Uh, last week was historic because this guy that we now know as the Apostle Paul for the first time like stepped forward as a leader and confronted this creepy dude that's like a sorcerer or something. Like, I don't know what wizardry is going on, uh, but he confronts this guy with this authority. And then it's the first recorded sermon ever preached by the Apostle Paul, the guy who would go on to, to write most of the New Testament. It's this amazing moment he's stepping forward. And, and here's the thing about his sermon. It really is like the, the outline of everything we read and hear from the Apostle Paul for the rest of his life and ministry because it centers on the person of Jesus who lived a life without sin and then laid his life down and then took his life up again and was raised from the dead. And, and we, we focused on that as we came together to communion last week, but I wanna circle back to the very end. I, I want us to pause at the end of his sermon this morning in a way that wasn't fitting as, as we were going to the Lord's table last week. So uh, look back again at, at verses number 38 and 39. 
This is the very end of his sermon, talking about Jesus being raised from the dead and comparing him even to King David. He said, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that this man, this Jesus of Nazareth, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Hallelujah. And here's why that's a really big deal. Because sins is something we all got. None of us are perfect. And I know you're, maybe somebody sitting next to their spouse going, I ain't that much of a sinner. And that might actually be true. But the reality is we all want access to God. We, we all want access to God for the things that would keep us from his holy and perfect presence. Hallelujah, Jesus came to make a way. Matter of fact, he is the way. <laughs> he is the truth and he's the life. But then check this out, verse 39. Here's why that's really important. By him, again, let's be sure we're talking about this is Jesus. <laughs> By him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Oh, here's a big deal. The Apostle Paul, right, this is his first sermon. So he's just kind of figuring stuff out, right? (laughs) He's gonna unpack this way deeper and truer to the church at Rome. He's actually gonna say the mission statement of the law was to help us know we're actually not free. The the reason the law came was to show us, here's all the ways to be perfect. Uh Uh-oh, I can't do that. I must need a savior. Enter Jesus, stage left. Or stage right, if you watch Fox News. Like, whatever, he he can't go from the left. This is my bad. Um, (laughs) Why you gotta go there? I don't know. Um, Enter Jesus. The law shows us Man, that we're actually in bondage. No matter how hard I try to, no matter how hard, how hard I try to keep getting better, it just doesn't work out too good. I, I need something other than me to, to rescue me from me. And even when I do experience forgiveness of these sins, it's very temporary. I need permanent forgiveness of sins and I need permanent freedom from sins. And the law can't do that. John, the beloved apostle, in John chapter one, verse 17 says the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. (laughs) Yeah, we got the law. Got it. Bad news. Grace and truth come through Jesus. Not to say there's not truth in the law and that there's not grace in the law. We're now freed to experience and live in grace now. And to be freed by the power of truth now in the person of Jesus, it changes everything. The law is this set of rules and standards we have to follow, and Jesus just came to give us access. A few weeks ago, we were on family vacation before Garrett left for college in uh, South Padre. I uh, mentioned that. We love South Padre. It's, it's a great little place. And it was, I think, the, the most kind of perfect family vacation we've ever had. It was just great. We stayed in this place that um, was on the the north end of the island. We never stayed there before, and it's kind of newer. And so this developer put in these sidewalks that looked like someone was really intoxicated when they were poured. And have you been to the north end of South Padre and you've seen these sidewalks all of a sudden? It's like, so when you get to, to South Padre, right? You turn left and start heading north and you drive past 700 bars and then the sidewalks get curvy? You know what I mean? Like, are there hidden cameras and we're just laughing at people? Like, And I don't mean like kind of wavy. I mean like we're walking and we're walking and we're walking. Like I'm not a bicyclist, but if I were, I would want to burn this thing down. It's just crazy. But I thought to myself, there has to be a reason for this. I know that I'm uh, sometimes a little overly orderly about such things. Hey, that was not meant to be that funny. (laughs) I'm a little orderly. It bugged me. And so my first Sunday back after that experience, I went to one of our church members whose life's job is to engineer roads and infrastructure. 
I went to Stephen Kitchens and said, I want all of your degree and work experience to please explain to me the logic of this. And with all of his authority, he said, I don't know. (laughs) That's the end of the story. And truly what, what we do when we try to blend Jesus with humankind's performance is we're kind of doing what the apostle Paul accused that wizard of doing in verse 10. We're making crooked the straight paths of the Lord, right? He's come to make a way. The apostle Paul's like, man, the, the law, you can keep it the best of your ability and you're gonna find yourself walking in circles. Jesus came to make a way into grace and truth, praise his name. So we kind of skimmed past that last week. I just wanted to go back and kind of end that because I thought that was worth saying. Now let's look at their response. Skip down to verse number 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. Isn't that cool? Here's what I want to say that. If you've spent your whole life in bondage, then then when you hear the sound of freedom, you want to hear it some more. And for some of us in this room, we know what it is to be in bondage to stuff. And we know what it is to be set free in Jesus. And we just want to sing about it and talk about it and celebrate it together, right? And I think maybe for some of us, we've been set free for so long, we forgot what it is to not be free. Because man, when, when, you, when you're just beginning to taste the, the, the joy of freedom, you're like, hey, can you repeat that from the top, please? That's literally what these people are saying. Like, I, I'd like to hear the sound of freedom a little more, please. And they begged them. Can you imagine that? Doug, can we please have church every day? No. But um, <laughs> verse 42, after the meeting, and again, there's just one phrase here that, oof, Like if you're an underliner or a highlighter, we're fixing to be in a moment that's worthy of a, all right. After the meeting, uh, the synagogue broke up. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke to them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. I just love that language. Like, why do Christians come together and sing songs and listen to sermons? Here's why. We're begging you. Please just keep moving forward in God's grace. He's got you and he loves you and he's for you. We are not saying, hey, continue in your best effort. Man, y'all go out there and do better and try harder. See you next Sunday. Right? Man, gross. No thanks. No, we're literally coming together saying, we urge you, like we're begging, just keep walking in his favor. (laughs) You got nothing to earn. You got nothing to prove. You got nothing to get right so that he'll accept you or love you. He's already lavished all of that on you and his son. Keep walking in that. Matter of fact, swim in it, row in it, drive in it. Just continue in the grace of God. I just love that language. Verse 44, the next Sabbath, oh, again, look at these words, almost the whole city. Isn't that beautiful? Almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if right now, this morning, almost all of Fort Worth gathered somewhere to hear the word of the Lord? Can, can we just have a shared prayer right now? God, we'd love for Fort Worth to look like that. Right? And let me just clearly say, because I think this needs to be said like at least once a year, and I don't know that I've said it lately. I don't mean let all of Fort Worth come to this church because we're better than everybody else. This is just somewhere under the sound preaching of God's word that is gospel centered and makes much of Jesus, may Fort Worth gather to hear you. It doesn't have to be here. We're not in competition with other gospel Bible preaching churches. We're not jealous of them. We're not trying to take people from them. We love this city so much. We want Jesus for them. And we'd love it if they came and hung out here, P.S. <laughs> but man, whatever. Like we're, we're not in opposition to any churches in this city except for the ones who don't make much of Jesus, right? Like, and there are a few, by the way. We can talk about that over coffee one day. Um, we want people to gather to hear the word of the Lord. That's the mission. What a beautiful Go almost the whole city. 
came together to hear God's word. And then we have the first word of the next verse, but. By the way, we're, we're gonna read a good bit of scripture together this morning. And I want you to look for the importance of the conjunctions. You're like, Doug, I don't remember anything from high school English. The connector words, the words that link together two sentences, thoughts, or phrases. I want us to specifically look for the word but. And here's why. That was awesome. (laughs) Here's why that's such an important word. Because every time God does a work, we're going to see the enemy do a work too. And somehow I feel like... (laughs) We want so bad to live in this happy, feel-good bubble, we want to ignore that there's opposition to the work of God. Or maybe we're in such a divided season right now, culturally, that we've forgotten that our real war is not with flesh and blood or political systems, red and blue, donkeys and elephants. No, there's an actual war that has eternal implications. Like we are in a battle. I I told our students this week, Uh, when I was speaking at at Temple Christian School this week. Here's the deal. I wish I didn't have to tell you this, but I owe it to you to tell you, Jesus is not the only person who has a plan for your life. Jesus is not the only person who has a plan for your marriage, for your testimony at your job, for your finances, for your health. He's not the only, and, and we can ignore that and find ourselves in defeat, or we can wake up and go, wait a second, this isn't paradise This is battleground. As we await paradise, as we move towards, as we continue in the grace of God towards paradise, we're at war, not with each other, with an actual enemy. And here's the thing about that enemy. He can't help it. In Newton's third law, for every action, there's an equal equal and opposite reaction, right? Right? The enemy is bound by the laws of nature. (laughs) Every time God does something, he just can't help but fight against it. It's just in his DNA. It's in his nature to resist God. A friend told me recently a quote that someone who discipled them said this, there's never an advancement in the kingdom of God which is not followed by a counteroffensive from the enemy. Never. Never. The reality is we're seeing God do some great work right now among temple ministries. And I just feel like we got to be honest enough this morning, this morning to say, that means that's not all that's on the move, right? Let's be aware that there's a big but in this season, right? There's, there's an opposition. Now, who does the enemy work through is also noteworthy, right? So, man, the whole, almost the whole city gathers together. Yay, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul and reviling him. Here's where the opposition came from. Super religious people. Usually the opposition of the enemy for good is not from atheists and crack dealers. It's from people who think they're more religious than you. It's people who got their black belt in judgy. That's usually where the enemy divides his people, right? Tullian Chavision said this, the devil's masterpiece is the Pharisee, not the prostitute. Right? The devil's masterpiece is the Pharisee, not the prostitute. Our sin lurks more deceptively in our goodness than in our badness. (laughs) When I'm proud of how right I've got it, that's where sin's most powerful, deadly, and dangerous. And the opposition we've read so far in the book of Acts, really only once or twice has it been the bad guys. Right? I mean, earlier in this chapter, we saw an actual wizard. I don't even know what that means. Right? But most of the opposition has been religious people. 
The greatest enemies of the work of Jesus are the people who are proud of themselves and their goodness. But they continued uh, to be faithful, to proclaim the word of God. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul's like, listen, I'm fixing to make y'all even matter. This good news we're proclaiming isn't just for Jewish people, it's also for Gentiles. They were already mad before he told them that. It was amazing. Skip down to verse number 48. When the Gentiles heard this, y'all, this is, this is again another little, if you're like a note taker or whatever, I want you to know this. When the Gentiles heard that Jesus brought good news to them too, when they heard this, they, mm, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And I just want to say this. What other appropriate response could there possibly be? When you find out that the best news that's ever been told on planet earth is for you, it's come in your direction. God's made straight the path for you to have access to God through no goodness that you've done, through no righteousness that you've earned, just because he loved you. Literally, just because he loved you. Not because you, he loved you and he thought you had some good skill sets he could borrow from. Nope, he just loved you and made straight the access to God the Father just for you. The only possible response to that is to rejoice and glorify God in his word. Like if we really believe that. See, it says that those who are appointed to eternal life believed. And so the question this morning is simply this. Do you really believe how good the good news is for you? Because I'll, I'll tell you this. Sometimes the routine and monotony, let alone the difficulties of life, beat my belief out of me sometimes. And the beauty of gathering together in a moment like this is when we sing these songs and read these scriptures, all of a sudden our faith gets focused in a little bit of, wait a second, I've got something worthy of rejoicing. I have a God who's worthy of glorifying. Amen? Amen. What better response could there be? Oh, wait, there's more. Because we have another conjunction. Look at the next verse. And the word of the Lord was spreading, which we're scared of that word in 2022, like a virus, <laughs> throughout the whole region. To which I would say, what other possible appropriate response could there be? <laughs> And both of those responses are, uh, this is one of those verse breaks that I love that they broke this up into two verses. Because here's the thing. Sometimes we need reminded, man, the good news that Jesus rescued me is worthy of rejoicing and glorifying God for. Yay me. And everybody else around me needs to know that too. Yeah. Right? So like, like this is a big and of it's not, if the good news is as good as we say it is, sing it is, and pray it is, then here's the deal. It's worthy of some rejoicing and glorifying God, and it's worth telling everybody else, hey, there's better news than all the bad news you're being inundated with. You keep scrolling, hoping a TikTok video is gonna make you laugh because life is sad. Introduce Jesus. Like here's something real that you can sink your teeth into and will change your life. Man, the, the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the region. Hallelujah. Next word, but. <laughs> there it is again. Come on, are you serious? Yep, but. The Jews incited the devout women of high standing. I gotta I got slow down here for just a second and say, oh, now the Jewish religious system all of a sudden honors women. Like, Seriously, guys, they're like, this Jesus guy even like values women. Quick, promote a woman. <laughs> but I'm not allowed to speak to them. You go promote, you know, ugh, ridiculous. So manipulative. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city. And it's just so funny they even listed women first in this verse. Like, it's just so not, uh, anyways. They stirred up persecution. Like now it's not just words anymore. Like I actually stirred up persecution 
against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. Which, uh, let me just say this about uh, that verse. Here's what's cool. So Iconium is not a city. It's a region made up of cities. You know what one of those cities is? No, I'll tell you. Galatia, right? The book of the Bible where we learn so much about the work of grace through the Holy Spirit, he's gonna meet those people in the midst of this persecution that drives him out because we serve a God who loves to introduce grace when life is at its worst. Anyways. And then this is so cool. Here's another important conjunction, and. They're being persecuted and driven from where they are, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. (laughs) You're like, don't you mean but? They're facing persecution, but somehow they found a way to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and put a smile on. No, in the midst of that, and they're filled with joy, filled with the Holy Spirit. Man, what is it to so experience grace that even when life is at its worst, we're full of joy and full of the Spirit? Isn't that incredible? No wonder people were like, hey, can you tell that from the top? Sing that one again. Like They're like, how can we hear more about this? Because even in persecution, they're filled with joy. And, And remember, this is being written. All right, pop quiz. By who? Don't say God. That's cheating. This is being written by who? Luke, yes. Who wasn't present. How does he know that they were full of joy? How does he know? It was so obvious to the people around them that they were still telling stories after Paul was long gone, that he was that full of joy. That's amazing, right? Like when people talked about him, They're like, he said some hard things, but he just radiated grace. Like in persecution, he was full of joy. Okay, so the apostle Paul, um, you ever wonder what he looked like? So what did it look like to be full of joy, right? What what would it look like? Maybe maybe he looks like one of us. Like, wouldn't that be cool to look like the apostle Paul, right? Interestingly, Uh, We have, uh, it's not part of the Bible. There's another book uh, that was written around this time that tells the story of a guy who lived in this region named Onesiphorus who saw the Apostle Paul in this very moment. Now, again, there's some debate about the historical accuracy of this work, but it's interesting. It describes the Apostle Paul. It says he, Onesiphorus, saw Paul approaching, coming to Iconium. A man, small in size, with meeting eyebrows. (laughs) Hello, I'm right. Hello, I'm left. We met. (laughs) They met. Yeah, some Dude was short with a unibrow. That's great. Maybe I don't want to look like the Apostle Paul. It goes on, with a rather large nose and bald-headed. Oh, wait. (laughs) Maybe, maybe I've got a unibrow coming sometime soon. (laughs) Bow-legged, which is weird, because like, didn't they wear skirts? How did we know? I don't know. Strongly built. Okay, yeah, we don't look anything alike. Full of grace. Here's why I'm bringing attention to this. He's describing his appearance. Isn't that cool? He saw him and went, you look like grace. I don't know what that means, but how cool is that? And then, listen to this. At times, he looked like a man, apparently not a very attractive man. (laughs) And at times, he had the face of an angel. An angel with a unibrow <laughs> and a big schnoz, but he looked like an angel. 
Like, what is it to be so full of the Holy Spirit and to so believe in the captivating glory of grace that people are like, are you an angel or a dude? Right? Like, that's, that's the glory of the fullness of the Spirit that's offered to us in Jesus that has now become this amazing legacy of a Christ who radiated in him. Look at the next chapter. At Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue. They spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. That's great news. Verse two, but there it is again. We're gonna see this pattern throughout. The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. That's great, but, but the people of the city were divided. And I think that's what always happens when we make much of Jesus, right? The people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews, some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra, which is super cool because there's a grandmother in Lystra that they're going to go meet named Lois. And she has a daughter named Eunice. And Eunice has a son named Timothy. Pretty amazing moment in history. And Derby. I don't know anything significant about that. <laughs> uh, which are cities of Lyconia and the surrounding country. And they continued to preach the gospel. Now at Lystra, we're about to read a really interesting story. Really interesting story for three reasons. I'll explain to you what the three reasons are, but first let's read the story. At Lystra, there's a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth, had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking and Paul looked intently at him, which is the same language we have earlier in the chapter when he's like, you son of the devil, but this looking intently is different. Um, he's looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, he said in a loud voice, stand up right on your feet and he sprang up and began walking. And for those of us who've been walking through the book of Acts together since January, does this sound familiar at all? That's the first reason this is a significant moment. This sounds like Acts chapter three, where Peter and John went up for the afternoon prayer time at the temple and they saw a man who'd never taken a step before and they spoke to him and immediately he sprung to his feet and he leapt and he danced, right? This, this is a, a uh, sign and wonder performed by the Holy Spirit to give authority to the apostle Paul. Like this is this powerful moment where he's standing up in his first moment of boldness. He's preaching the first recorded sermon and it was theologically accurate. And so they're like, hey, you should write some. And, and now... This pivotal moment, God does the same miracle through him. But it's also cool for two other reasons. When the crowd saw that, uh, what Paul had done, they list, lifted up their voices saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Hey dude, don't make it weird. Don't make this awkward. Barnabas they called Zeus. You had to make it weird. And Paul Hermes, because he was a chief speaker. And if any of you have seen Thor, Love and Thunder, this verse you know, is like totally messed up for you right now. Um, and and he, here's the second reason this is a really interesting story. And this one is, is just historical, super quick. Um, if you have studied ancient literature, like in college or whatever, maybe there's a Roman poet that you heard about in school really famous, with a terrifying name, Ovid. Not COVID, <laughs> just O-V-I-D. You ever heard of Ovid before? Um, pretty significant guy. Um, as believers, we think Ovid's interesting because he was appointed by Caesar Augustus, which is the one who decided that all the world should be taxed in Luke chapter 2. Right? He was the, the ruler at the time of the birth of Jesus. He appointed Ovid to be an official Roman poet, and then he banished Ovid for something that historians have no idea what it is. Juicy gossip, whatever. Ovid is this poet, and so he did what poets do. He made up a weird thing. He made up a legend, a story. And his story is about the town of Lystra, where they are. 
And the story that he made up probably, I don't know, 100 years before this moment, if we're guessing, maybe a little more. The story he made up is that Zeus and Hermes traveled from the heavens to Lystra. And when they got there, they were hungry and tired. So apparently Zeus was just not that impressive. Traveling from heaven can work up quite the appetite. They traveled to Lystra and and needed nourishment and rest. And the legend is that no one in Lystra would provide them food or lodging, except for one elderly peasant couple, a man named Philemon, not the one from the Bible, Philemon and his wife, an elderly peasant couple, invited Zeus and Hermes into their humble little home, fed them a meal, and gave them a place to rest. After which, the gods rose up and drowned the city and killed everyone in it. Because apparently, when they are hungry, (laughs) they expect to be fed. Maybe some of you are like, I have teenage sons. They wanted to to kill all of us too, because food wasn't ready, right? Like this, there was no food and lodging. They destroy the whole town, drown everyone in it, except for Philemon and his wife. They turn their little home into a beautiful temple to worship Zeus and Hermes. They appoint them as priest and priestess of the temple. And when they died in old age, they became two beautiful majestic trees in the middle of the city of Lystra. That's the fake made up story that at this time would have been told by a couple generations. So when Paul heals this dude, they're like, we don't wanna get drowned this time. Quick, let's recognize them as Zeus and Hermes. Look at the next verse. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, where apparently Philemon used to live, right? According to the the legend, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But here's the third, that's just interesting for historical reasons and has nothing to do with anything. I found it fascinating. Here's where I think it's most important. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard it, they tore their garments. If you didn't grow up around the church or biblical uh, imagery, you might not know that the significance of tearing your garments is, is the sign of grief, anguish, sorrow, and heartbreak. Tearing the garments is, is a picture of a heart that is torn. Someone from a distance might not see the tears in your eyes, but they could tell that your outer outer garments had been torn and tattered because you're grieving this. They tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd crying out, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature like you. Here's why this moment's so significant. I think that the Apostle Paul would be horrified that we have named cathedrals after him. I think he would be horrified that we have named Christian schools after him. I think he would be horrified that we've named hospitals after him. Although if I had feet that didn't work, I would still go to that hospital and just see if it worked again. Because what we see in those who really began the movement It's not about the dude on the stage. It's all about the king on the throne. And here's the deal. That's supposed to be our story in our chapter as well. It's not about the celebrity, the famous, the make much of the guy. It's all about King Jesus. And he begs them, please don't make much of us. And here's what he told them. Here's, our, here's why we're here. Here's our claim to fame. Here's the only good thing we have to offer you. We bring you good news. <laughs> and we're not the good news. Like we're just a billboard. We're just pointing. That, that, that's all we came to do. We're just here to point you to the, the savior of the world. To, so, that, so that you can turn from these vain, ridiculous, goofy legends to a living God. A God who lives, who created you. A a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And so they they begged him, please don't worship us. And then skip down a couple of verses, uh, verse number 18. Even with these words, the people scarcely restrained, 
They scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. They're like, are you sure? Please, uh, that sounds very Zeusy. You know, like, are you sure you're not these guys? We really want to sacrifice to you. And, uh, and we're almost done. A few more verses here. But we've got another but. Verse number 19, Jews came from Antioch, which is where they'd been, right? And Iconium, where they'd just been. And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. So in one verse, we want to worship you. And in the next verse, we want to kill you. That sounds familiar too, doesn't it? That the same lungs that cried out Hosanna on Friday cried out crucify him, right? This idea that they thought he was dead, and I don't know what that means, but they, they so punished him, they, they assumed he was dead, and they left him. But... Now this, this is a whole different kind of but. When the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and he ran away and hid because those people tried to kill him. Oh my goodness, no. He entered the city. <laughs> so if you're a note taker, you can just write down these two words, what courage. Oh my goodness. That's what grace does. The work of grace doesn't just set me free from my mess. It produces this new courage in me to stand in the face of opposition and persecution and say, but he's so good <laughs> that I'm full of joy and full of the Holy Spirit in this grace. You can try to silence me all you want. It's still worth telling the story. What courage. Oh my soul, what courage. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. Like, what's the plan? We're gonna keep going insane in this area. All right, where are we going next? Let's go. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium to Antioch. Look at what, look at what they're saying. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Listen, this thing's gonna be difficult. Let's, let's keep moving. If anybody knew that, he just got a, a, an execution attempt on his life, right? And when they appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And here's what I would say to that. What community? Like the, these people who rose up in courage continued to go forward making disciples and strengthening them together and encouraging them together and strengthening the work of their community and in, in, in their, in their little congregations together. Because the Apostle Paul understand this work, this work of grace that we continue in. Man, it's really hard to continue in that alone. We need each other, right? We need each other. If we're gonna to continue to persevere in the face of opposition, if we're gonna to continue to grow in the grace of the Lord, then we need each other. We need a community. I know we have some folks who are kind of new here to Temple, but we've got like a bumper sticker thing that we say, and we want it to be a broken record around here. We believe that circles are better than rows. Man, coming together this morning and sitting in a row is a good and healthy thing. It's a holy thing that we remind ourselves that he's worthy of rejoicing and, and glorifying the Lord in his word. That's super important. But it's really hard to get to know a person looking at the back of their head, right? And sitting in a circle and actually encouraging each other and being able to, to pray for somebody's child by name. Can, is there a greater power in the whole world than knowing somebody's praying for your kid? I mean, maybe your kids have it all together. But I'm telling you, I invite lost people to pray for my kids. Like, pray for us, man. Come on. 
(laughs) There's something so beautiful about God's children coming together. We're better together. And I think if we're gonna grow and be strengthened in the work of God, we need each other. And so I'm excited to tell you um, that this morning we're announcing the relaunch of community groups again for our church body. And truly, I believe with all my heart, this is the DNA of what it is to be ecclesia. Is actually not what happens Sunday morning. It's what happens in a circle, in a, in a conversation, not a lecture. Okay? Um, Ovid had nothing to do with community groups getting blown up, but COVID sure did. And so we, we sort of soft launched them again this past January, and we're thrilled to, to truly be on-ramping them again. They'll kick back uh, the second Wednesday of September. So this morning, um, during announcements, there's going to be a QR code on the screen. There's a QR code at the Welcome Center, and our facilitators uh, will be out at the Welcome Center to talk to you today. Because uh, if you don't know anybody, you can just pick which one you think is, is the coolest, and then judge the other ones, and then uh, decide who you're going to sign up with. In all, all seriousness, if you're like, man, I don't know what group would like fit my personality or my life stage the best or whatever, just ask us. We, we, we do our best to, to connect you in a place that makes sense for you. Um, if you're worshiping online, uh, weren't able to be here today, in the description of this video is a link to sign up for those community groups as well. Uh, we don't want you to have to wait on that because uh, you want to see a plug in. Because if we're really going to grow in courage and in grace, then we're going to need to grow in community because we need each other. Even as people have come forward the last few weeks saying, hey, I want to officially say I'm joining the church. This is my church home. That's just a declaration of community. That's just a declaration of, hey, we're in this together. And I think that's a healthy and holy thing because I don't know about y'all. I don't want to do this alone.